Hi, I'm Jay Cohen, writer of Astounding Tales. You could read issue zero for free at funnyfigs.com backslash astounding tales. And you are listening to Two Geeks Talking. Good morning, afternoon, evening, everyone. Two Geeks Talking is an entertainment industry interview show where we interview the creative people from the comic, film, TV, movie, and video game industries. And of course, I'm your host, Kurt Sasso. We are joined today by a very talented comic creator. He is the cool uncle in his family. He is the amazingly talented writer of a fun series that I just happened to read the first two issues of. We are joined today by the ever-talented Jay Cohen, of course, from The Astounding Tales. How are you doing today? Very good. Thank you for the uh, the lovely talk up. Very flattered. Hopefully, I could uh, live up to to that uh, to that uh, build up right there. Well, I mean, I'm not saying turn in your geek card after the interview's done if you fail the interview, but I mean, you know, we'll, we'll have some fun with it. Uh, looking forward to it. Looking forward to it. <laughs> so, for those that don't know anything about Astounding Tales, tell us what it's all about. It's a set. It's a contemporary comic. It's very much a love letter to the uh, Silver Age comics of Stan and Jack. I grew up with comics that were more of a kind of deconstructionist take on the genre of the superhero genre, stuff like uh, Watchmen, Dark Knight. But as we were talking earlier, born in '83, so kind of that late '80s, early '90s of like dark, gritty comics, or like, what if this was real? And those are wonderful comics. It's not even me describing that in terms of like a pejorative or whatever. In terms of what I grew up with and what I was immersed in, an earnest take on the genre in terms of like what Stan and Jack did for me is kind of refreshing. And I was uh, inspired. The time kind of blurs together with the, the pandemic the last like year or two. But I guess at the start of the pandemic, I read a Jack Herbie biography by Mark Evanier. And it was just like super inspired to like us do an earnest take on the genre. Originally, the whole genesis of Astounding Tales in terms of the story or the narrative, I wrote a four-pager for back when 2008 AD, before the pandemic, would take Future Shock submissions, uh, four-pagers. Once the pandemic hit, within a few weeks, they changed their policy on no longer uh, taking uh, script submissions for you know four-page Future Shocks. So I had this four-pager that I enjoyed through Reddit. Met up with Ray, the uh, Ray Griffith, the amazing artist who kind of brings everything to life. Without him, I've said this many times before. Pretty much, the comic would just be like uh, Pac-Man, dicks, and stick figures. That's all I can draw. <laughs> so without him, you know, he's the magic magic pan. We hooked up through um, comic collabs on Reddit. He liked the four pager, so I commissioned him to do the four pager. He liked it so much, he threw in a fifth page, a splash page for free. That turtle getting smacked up, that giant awesome splash page. That was uh, just Ray being inspired. I super appreciate it. And we like working together. Then we did a Kickstarter to get um, issue number one done. That was successful. We got that shipped and that's awesome. And now, right now we're in the, uh, the script is done for for two. He started doing some of the pencils, hopefully kind of early springish. We hope to launch a Kickstarter around, like I said, maybe early springish for uh, issue two chugging along here as best we can you know a lot of indie creators that have kind of day jobs and he actually has a, a kid in addition to a day job so he has to keep like a human being alive other things pulling at our time but we, we're uh, like i said plugging away chop, chopping wood chopping that tree down yeah you know, I, I love independent creators because the, not only just because of the pandemic but because of how stories evolve and how characters get created and how worlds get built you know it's it's amazing the thought processes and the influences obviously when it comes to not only the superhero genre but any genre for that matter when it comes to independent comic creators how did you come up with the world that you built because world building i think is fascinating from a, not only from a creative perspective but from a, a person's mindset when it comes to building the world itself i mean in some ways I've been preparing my whole life for this, but um, in terms of, uh, I have an academic background, I have an undergrad and an MA in film theory. And uh, just in terms of, like genre and archetypes and consuming way too much TV and comics since I was a child and really my parents never monitoring what I was consuming and having older siblings. In terms of world building, it's really, hey, what genre are we working in? What story are we trying to tell? I don't want to say paint, by numbers, because that would be kind of inaccurate and very reductive. I know in terms of like the tools of the toolbox and kind of the trappings and stuff like that. And for me personally, some type of parameter helps me in the writing process, whether it's a page count 
a genre or Ray just telling me like, hey, these are the type of characters I would like to draw, or this is the type of genre or setting or whatever. Um, that kind of little seed in terms of both narrative and a little bit to the world building, the analogy of like a gardener versus an architect. I'm definitely much more of a gardener. It organically comes about like, we're the characters now, who are the worlds? And then just kind of thinking about that, letting it kind of grow on its own, planting those seeds and uh, watering the plant and then uh, effing the plant. I don't know. <laughs> when it comes to uh, nameology, then nameology is always important when it comes to character creation. Oh, yeah. Did you have, and, I, and we could talk about the foibles and, and the strong names that have come out through comic history as well as in even in film for that matter how did you come up with the names or did, did a name just kind of pop into your head while you were okay writing this story? that's a great question actually names are one of the things i have difficulty with oftentimes when i make up a name they always sound silly to me like oh that's obviously made up like i think maybe that's some of the brilliance and some of the more popular sci-fi when like in star wars or something like that and you're like that nonsense word sounds plausible to me or even like game of thrones or something like that more that nonsensical thing that was totally made up sounds kind of real to me a lot of times i will borrow names of family and friends but the character won't be based on them so I'll be like why is that serial killer like named after me like no no dude i just needed a name that sounded like real to me then of course we do the classical you know alliteration peter parker you know bruce banner that kind of thing that that uh, fun superhero genre tradition of alliterative names and then also the name uh either william or billy it oftentimes finds it into my work um so just like i mentioned just a moment ago that i use names of people i know i have a, uh, one of my best friends passed away when i was in my early 20s not to be too much of a downer sorry guys but anyway his name was william he went by billy he went by the male spelling b-i-l-l-y but oftentimes if i have a protagonist or a character that i think is cool or that i like or whatever that name finds it into like a lot of my work so in this case billy potts is the female version of that spelling if it's alliterative that's probably just like a fun name I came up with, David Ditko, for a kind of a spider-ish homage. You know, I don't want to get sued here by the powers of be. you know, it's, it's an homage. So those are kind of where the uh, the names come up with. I definitely saw some nods to some famous individuals. Jack is a, a nod to Jack Kirby, and that's kind of why he's drawn a little, little stockier, and he's got obviously a thing t-shirt. Being the children of immigrants, Jack Kirby, widely known as the, the, the child of Eastern European Jewish immigrants. So this is a contemporary story. So while people do, you know, immigrants come to America from all over in terms of contemporary, uh, I guess, immigration patterns, I guess, for lack of a better word, that making his heritage a South American, his parents immigrating from South America would just would make it a little more contemporary. That is also a nod to kind of Jack's heritage. It's great to see that you're thinking through the character creation because a lot of times people don't really give secondary or supporting characters too much thought. They just happen to be there to push the story. I'm not saying yours do whatsoever. Oh. You, you have a great cast the characters I'm Thank saying, you. In, in general they're focused so much on the main character they don't focus so much on the secondary or, or supporting character well a, a big inspiration also also um chris claremont's x-men that's mm -hmm. like in terms of superhero comics like superhero punchy punchy comics that's my jimmy jam i grew up kind of the tail end of that but you can still get like classic x-men and even like with those kind of mediocre-ish kind of 90s X-Men comics, it was always like, oh, these are cool. Oh, you know what's really the awesome stuff? Like Days of Future Past, God Loves Man Kills, like trade paperbacks, I guess, weren't as popular then, but still like the Barry Windsor Smith Weapon X, where like, I don't think he says like a word in the whole comic or whatever. Like, I remember that was like the jam when I was a kid. So in terms of like a cast of characters that all get to grow and kind of interact with each other, whether it's in the forefront of kind of my head when I'm writing, it's definitely somewhere in the, definitely in the back recesses kind of in the soup. And then in terms of the writing process, just for me, it helps me a little bit. I'm putting these people in a room and I'm imagining what they're doing. And they're recording that almost like a fly on the wall. So unless I know who they are, and I'm not saying maybe like, I'm maybe not for every character doing a hugely extensive backstory, but I have to be like, who is this person? Even if they are an, an archetype, still, I need to know who's this archetype? How would they react? That's kind of, for me, at least a big part and kind of knowing what would this person say? So then how has your degree in, in film helped you as a creative writer for comics? During my undergrad, I had a professor explain 
there are two types of people that uh, enjoy sausage. There are some people that eat sausage and they go, mm, that is delicious. I like sausage. And there are another group of people who eat sausage and they go, oh, I like sausage. I wonder how the sausage is made. Maybe uh, I was intimidated by it, but I've never really had too much of a desire in terms of the technical aspect of how the sausage is made. I've always were like, where do stories come from? Like, why do people make these decisions in narrative? Because even since I was a little kid, I always had a pretty good distinction of fiction and nonfiction or what was real. Like, I knew that there was someone called a director. I didn't know what specifically their job was, but I had a vague notion that like, that's the person that tells stories. They're the person that makes movies. Like I knew pretty much Steven Spielberg and George Lucas. That's the dude that makes Star Wars. Like that's the dude that makes Indiana Jones. Like they make stories, they make movies. And then I always wondered like, why does this character do this versus this? Why are the stories the way they are? Kind of academically, one of the things that interests me about film is how, what does it tell about a culture? What can I learn about a culture or people uh, through their films through their story. So I do watch kind of some esoteric artsy fartsy stuff uh, every once in a while or stuff like that through school. But really it's more the kind of, that's usually watched by like a spe specific strata of a culture and may not totally communicate what a culture uh, is like or what their interests are, what their fears are, what their anxieties are, but stuff that's kind of maybe quote unquote low art or popular arts or uh, things that are just widely consumed to me are more interesting because they tell you like, who are these people? What are their fears? What are their anxieties? Like it's no mistake that those early silver age comics of the sixties, everyone's getting powers through some kind of nuclear accident gone awry. While we know in the real world, those will probably give you like cancer or lymphoma or something in Marvel comics, they tend to uh, give you, bestow you wonderful powers or, or, you know, in films of that era where there's a 50 foot giant woman or a giant, a giant animal, like a giant ant or, specifically Godzilla, there's the nuclear anxiety. So also in terms of Astounding Tales, very much the issues are definitely like anxieties of a culture or our culture, American culture, more of a contemporary take. Unfortunately, I think nuclear anxiety will be on the rise in the near future, not to get like too newsy or political or whatever. Before the recent news in the year or two prior to this, when we were, uh, Rain and I are producing this comic kind of um, technology the birth of AI, what does it mean to be human, and then consciousness and the environment. These are all things that you could see throughout the comic and the, instead of kind of the nuclear anxieties of 1961, 62, 63 and on, or in Cold War stuff, uh, which unfortunately that seems to be making a comeback as well. But uh, I digress, you know, in the prior year or two, you could see kind of a, in the comics where the antagonists come and the stories kind of arise just as Silver Age Marvel Comics did from kind of uh, the contemporary issues and anxieties and stuff like that. What strengths does Ray bring to your creative process as an artist? And what do you bring to his creative process as a writer? Well, in terms of writing, we do do a, use a script, but it's not, I wouldn't say full script because I write it kind of very similar to a screenplay, where if people aren't familiar, a screenplay isn't going to have things like music cues. It's not going to tell any camera movements. It's not going to like tell you like in terms of like the shots or whatever, because that's the director's prerogative. So even if they did put it in, it would be disregarded. A film screenplay or a TV like teleplay or whatever will have like a description of the scene and then a dialogue. So I will have the panel count at the top of the scene heading and every panel will have a panel description and the dialogue and the captions and all that. And if there needs to be like information about like what characters are like thinking or kind of the, their inner life or whatever, if that helps context to kind of what he has to show in their emotions. In terms of his like design background, I'd never put in really anything regarding panel layout. That's all him. And then also in kind of my little preamble at the beginning of the script, I'm like, hey, Ray, what's up? This is what this is about. Bah, bah, bah. He definitely has clients to like adjust the panel count. So like usually I'll be around like five panels each page to give him room if he needs to compress or if he thinks it could be compressed that he can do that. Or on the other hand, if he's like, oh, shake like this panel description, this cannot happen in one panel. He can stretch, stretch it out. And then also gives him an opportunity um, with a number like five to play with the panel kind of layout where I feel like if I use like even numbers, it's kind of playing into that. We're doing like a kind of Watchmen symmetrical kind of a uh, grid type deal. And then in terms of design as well. So I definitely, you know, talk to him before the writing process. Like, is there anything specifically you want to draw? 
you know, I want to give him room. And I think you see it in the work of the enthusiasm of in terms of like this design of like kind of creature design and stuff like that. In issue zero, I just said like a kaiju type creature like attacks the city. And I'm like, here's the ball and go with, run with it. Like, like I'm a Long Island stereotype. I grew up playing lacrosse, <laughs> coaching lacrosse. And then later after playing college coaching lacrosse, a big thing in coaching, I think you should put your players in a position to succeed. A little bit of that in terms of the script, giving enough where he's got a clear picture of like who these characters are, what's the narrative, kind of what's the story, what's happening. But at the same time, giving him space to kind of fill in the blanks and tell the story as well. So I think that's also some of my strong suits are giving him enough, but then not treating him like he's my like drawing robot that like he's, you know, an active member in kind of telling the story and creating the story. In terms of using a film analogy, I almost look at him. He's more like the director and the cinematographer and I'm the screenwriter. I'm the writer. I'm giving him the kind of the blueprints, the architecture, and then he's building the house. Looking at then the, the creation of these two uh, issues, and I'm sure you're going to create more as well too, as, as yeah. you have said earlier in the interview itself, what was the hardest scene for you to write? It's a good question. I think in general, both for Ray and I, does the process of learning, like of being cognizant, how many words, how many word balloons can go into a, a panel, I guess. And then also just being cognizant, I think, in general, not every character is going to be kind of representative of my um, life experiences. I guess <laughs> I have a little bit of that Kevin Smith in me where all the characters sound like me. I don't know if delicate's the right word, but being respectful. If I'm like kind of depicting or writing a character who is not necessarily representative of kind of my life experiences or, or who I am, whether it's kind of gender, sexuality, like whatever, and just kind of being mindful of that. It's a tough question because I don't want to come off like uh, arrogant or full of myself, be like, it was none of it was difficult, but it was kind of, it was a, a pleasure. It was a labor of love. It, it was something I chose to do. It wasn't like a gun to my head. It wasn't a, a, a mercantile kind of thing uh, or a mercenary type thing. These are characters I created. I, I happen to like them. It's tough to, to answer your question with like, no, it, there wasn't any, but it, it never was like kind of a pulling teeth thing. And and I like to think the same, Ray would say the same thing about working with me. It's truly a pleasure to work with him. He, he's an easygoing dude. Um, in terms of the collaborative process, there, uh, I believe both Chris and Claremont and Jim Lee tell the story the same way. Anyway, I've heard it a few times where uh, Jim Lee's first issue as the full-time writer on Uncanny, it's the issue with a flashback issue with Wolverine, uh, Captain America, and Black Widow. And the story goes that uh, before Chris wrote the story, he's like, Jim, who are your favorite characters? And he's like, uh, Wolverine, Captain America, Black Widow. And that's how that issue came to be. He you know, wrote it with the artist in mind and kind of what they want to do. That makes it enjoyable too. Like, oh man, I hope he digs this. Like the end issue one has some kind of like body horror elements. That was definitely, he's like, I, you know, I dig horror. Like, even though it's definitely like a general audience, like kids can read it kind of, Marvel Comics, DC Comics kind of general audience, there is a little bit of kind of body horror stuff at the end of issue one. That was definitely because Gray's like, oh, I dig some horror stuff. So there's a lot of elements in there that were like, oh, I think Ray's going to dig this or he asked for this. And going into the comic book aspect here, what was the first comic book that made you hate a character? And what was a comic book that made you cry? Oh, this is such like a guy answer. <laughs> There's elements of the Dark Knight Returns where he's like at the end, like this is a good life. And it's kind of how Carrie, like the stuff with Robin where he's like flashing back and he's confusing like who she is. He's like, oh, the that, you know, the Batmobile, that's what, what Dick would call it. And that like weird relationship of like, he's a broken man, but he's not a man. And I think the, the move, the last movie, the Batman captured this well, he's stuck as that child because of trauma or whatever he is a kid and this has really only occurred to me kind of recently so it always is odd like why is he taking this like child with him you know this is obviously a child endangerment but it kind of makes sense that he is also a broken child in the the body of this like hulking man so he is kind of linking up with another broken child and then the idea of like him choosing life instead of death. But that's such like a stereotypical, like, I'm a middle-aged man and Dark Knight Returns makes me cry. Oh, uh, there's definitely stuff in Why the Last Man 
there's just such visceral stuff. I, I think, I don't know if I cried, but it was definitely a shocking moment that always stays with me. Cause especially being like a kid of like eighties action movies where people are like taking bullets in the arms and legs and they're, they're always fine. That scene where he, uh, York is with forget there was like a car mechanic or something like that. He's with a female and there's gunfire and he's safe. He doesn't get hit. And she gets shot in the leg and he's like, Oh, thank goodness. Like you only got shot in the leg. Like I thought you were going to, I forget. It's been a few years since I have read why the last man, but he's like, thank goodness. You know, you only got shot in the leg or whatever, but it hit her femoral artery and you could die at seconds, which is what happened. So, but there's definitely parts in why the last man that were like super tragic to me. I wouldn't say I'm an easy crier, but like stories, like, yeah, stories can definitely make me cry. And actually sometimes it makes me feel a little weird about it Catcher in the Rye, my sister gave it to me in like fourth grade. Like the, the teacher actually called my house to say like, your child's like reading an inappropriate book. But anyway, it's always been like a favorite book of mine since I read it as a kid. But the one, one of the scenes that sticks with me is the, uh, in Radio City Music Hall. When uh, for people who don't know in New York, Radio City Music Hall, the, the large venue with the Rockettes and stuff used to actually play movies as well. Um, and the book takes place when it used to take, they used to show movies back in the day and Holden sees a woman and her child watching a movie. I forget what the movie is about, but the child keeps saying like, mommy, mommy, I have to go to the bathroom. And the mom is like telling the kids, like basically like, shut up. Like I'm watching the movie, like, you know, hold it in or whatever. And the idea of that, the mom is so enraptured in this fiction going on the screen that she's kind of and ignoring like a real human next to her that's kind of uh you know that needs to use the bathroom that's in pain you know is suffering so sometimes i do feel goofy like crying at star wars being like oh he just wanted to have a family at the end and he hates sand uh, now he's a burnt nub uh, space hitler that's so sad like he just wanted a family so yeah sometimes i do feel goofy at that stuff but yeah that's oh so that's some that's not a comic book answer i'm not a huge fan of the prequels but that's like if you watch them kind of the end of three and the beginning of four, that kind of when you watch those two kind of sandwich together and that really links up the tragedy of like all that dude really wanted was to be with his like old lady and his two kids. But that led to such a tragic him kind of being so crazy that now he's a burnt up nub in this suit and he's become space Hitler. I guess that's an example. I guess it's not a comic book example, but that's someone who, you know, on one level you hate, he is space Hitler. He blows up planets. But on the other hand, that he's a super tragic guy that like he is in this love almost is what brought him to this situation. So much love, so much of wanting everything that he's you know never had. He ends up like a little nubby dude yelling at his, his best friend and, you know, whatever. And we know what happens. Never heard Vader referred to as Space Hitler. That's a new one for me. <laughs> I mean, technically it was Palpatine as Space Hitler, but that's... Oh, it's like, yeah, I don't know if he's like Space Goebbels or whatever. <laughs> it's one, of, one of those guys, yeah. I mean, he does use stormtroopers. Uh, I think, And action movies kind of tell you this kind of, what does a culture look on as a term of, of, of a morally reprehensible uh, you know kind of characters that can be used as cannon fodder and we don't feel for them so oftentimes in like a modern superhero movie you'll use some type of like robots or cgi thing because we're not meant to relate to them they have no inner life so when they get dashed away there's no kind of like moral kind of why did they just annihilate all those things and if you're going to use real people in that sense in your narrative the nazis that you go to the not because then you know yeah you know, who cares they're, they're cannon fodder they're nazis they're they're reprehensible we don't have to worry about their their inner life or whatever you know they're the same function as battle droids what is your creative kryptonite i don't know i mean i haven't wrote a lot of romance and stuff like it stuff like that you know a lot of the stuff i've written is stuff um in terms of like the fiction i've written is stuff that's like very much in my kind of wheelhouse of like genre stuff science fiction stuff dealing with like kind of like heady ideas but i guess like maybe something that's just like maybe some kind of rom-com oh you know what else i love like detective stories actually if you read some of the conan doyle stuff like, so sometimes it's like this elaborate of like how did holmes deduce that but oftentimes it's just like and watson remarked like that's remarkable you know how did he do it so that thing kind of like um either like a heist or something where you need to like have an elaborate thing kind of worked out i love reading and watching stuff like that making a character who's supposed to be 
the smartest person in the room. Like I would have trouble like writing a MacGyver. I'm not OG MacGyver, not this yeah. new MacGyver. That's not my MacGyver. Fucking Richard Dean Anderson. Yeah, of MacGyver. course. And I guess they have advisors and stuff like that. But yeah, coming up with those like varied step kind of plans, like either a homie Holmesian or a MacGyver, kind of like very elaborate type of heist type deal i'd be more of a uh, usual suspects mm-hmm. where it turns out it was just the things all in the background he was looking at all all along <laughs> it'd be much more simpler things like that to be fair that was probably one of the best put together films when it comes to just trying to do basic deduction of it i, I thought it was brilliantly done Oh, yeah. Yeah. And it's a good example of like the turn, you know, like every movie that you love always has a turn, you know, even something like Empire, you know, has the turn the, the thing that's completely unexpected. I think if you think back to most narratives, and that's actually with issue zero, the quote unquote turn plays a big, large in issue zero because it was originally supposed to be a future shock. So and then I don't know if anyone's familiar in the 2080 future shocks are like kind of Twilight Zone things that are supposed to have a twist at the end. If it works, if you enjoy it. You know, I think that's one of the things that makes it it work. You know, I don't want to speak for other people's experience or whatever, but if it happened to work for you, I think that's one of the the things that that help it work. But but that's what gets us excited about about the geekdoms that we enjoy. If there's something that's unexpected and that dives you deeper into the genre that you're you're passionate about, it just solidifies you know that you're really excited about what you're reading. So especially with with astounding tales there. I, I love the fact that when I saw that, that particular reveal, I was just like, wow. Like I, I didn't expect it because if you're reading it at face value, you're not seeing the the turn coming quite literally. You just think it's, everything is status quo of a, of a 12 year old girl. Yeah. She's a tween. Yeah. I, I believe she's yeah. 12. Yeah. She's a tween. Well, I think that's also kind of um, in terms of like, I don't know, internet, culture people are very demanding i guess because of the internet of like what they want to see in their art uh in their narratives whatever and sometimes the internet gets really angry (laughs) when it doesn't get those things but it's like people not seeing the forest or the trees that the the stuff they love the most is the stuff like i was saying before with the turn the thing you weren't expecting the red wedding so it's kind of weird that people seem to be so up in arms like almost like treating it like this is like burger king and you could get it your way when the stuff they lost to the contrary is when they were almost a, a sushi chef or a sushi place, you could say like omakase, like, you know, chef's choice, that that's usually the awesomest stuff. The stuff, the stuff you didn't know you wanted um, is usually, uh, at least for me, the, the most rewarding experience is like, oh my God, the biggest compliments I could give to like a story is like, oh, that's some fucked up shit. Like something that's like so unexpected, so crazy. I'm like, that's fucked up. Like I never thought of that. And I guess, but also I guess with a grain of salt, because, uh, there's some kind of stat I heard I've heard numerous times floating around that like the people that tweet are like the 10% of people that like actually like use the app or something like that. It's almost like back in the day, like if you're mad enough to write a letter, it still holds true that like, you know, most people are lurking that if you're like going to be like, I hate this or like, uh, you know, more Zack Snyder or less Zack Snyder, you know, I don't, no one come after me. I'm just trying to think of an example, you know, Star Wars, whatever that you, you are getting them a kind of a, a segmented strata. If you only lived in the internet, it would give you a kind of a distorted worldview of like what, you know, people's actually opinions or whatever are. What was an early experience where you learned that language had power? I can't point to like a single, it's really that just films in general that like being moved by just like a powerful voice and, and orator. Like I'm trying to think of like, you know what? I'm going to say kind of, because uh, I saw it before, Clark, I'm going to say kind of mall rats. You could have characters, and this sounds kind of weird from like, like a straight, like suburban dude, you know, that like people that sound like me or sound like me and my friends, like typically I'm kind of um, the demographic that's very much catered to. But like really Kevin Smith stuff was the first stuff where I'm like, oh, you can make a movie, a major motion picture. That's like, it's on HBO right now, you know, that uh, not right now, but when I was watching it as a kid, uh, people really do talk like me and my friends. You can talk about comic books and Star Wars and stuff like that in a movie. And like, while you're walking through the mall and stuff like that, and it's completely valid and it's an art form and it's valid as both entertainment and art. So, yeah, I think that kind of very influential on me because also I have a oh, sister's 14 years older than me. So I was seeing from a young age, like independent films, art films, radar art films, like everything under the sun. So I had an idea of like, there is kind of levels of kind of uh, expression or what people consider like 
good films or great art or high art or whatever. And that movies can be mass entertainment, but they could also be considered like great works of art or whatever in the canon of great works. And so I, I had a concept of that already. And then seeing someone like Kevin Smith, who's like going to like Sundance and stuff like that, that like, oh, you would talk about like the contractors that could blown up on the Death Star. And like, this is considered on par with what's early 90s, like uh, leaving Las Vegas or mm -hmm. something like that in terms of words, but also stories that had like that, that had an impact on me. And I guess people, his movie are very wordy. You know, it's more more the words, especially those early ones, more the, the words than the, the images. Before I do that, uh, is there anything that I haven't touched on that you'd like those that are watching, listening to this interview to know about? But it's the Brooklyn Independent uh, Comics Showcase. And that's being thrown by uh, St. Mark's Comics. They not, they're now in Brooklyn, so I don't know if any any New Yorkers uh, out there uh, listening on the internet, but St. Mark's Comics, uh, New York Landmark was in the East Village forever. It's one of, was one of my favorite comic book stores. Uh, they've since, because of economics or whatever, moved to Brooklyn. They are doing the Brooklyn uh, Indie Comics Showcase, and uh, I will be in attendance. Astounding Tales will have a table there on uh, April 9th. Um, so supporting indie comics. And then if anyone else is ever touristing through Brooklyn, I highly recommend St. Mark's comics. I don't work for them. They are just a huge part of my childhood. My sister used to live around the corner on St. Mark's and second Avenue, uh, as a child during the early and mid nineties, purchased a lot of mediocre X-Men comics there. So I have much love for their station 11 on HBO. It's, it's a, it's a show how comic books end up saving humanity after the apocalypse. Or a comic or, or a graphic novel, a few copies of a graphic novel. Doesn't really spoil really much. Just know that at the end, a graphic novel is what it is able to uh, restart, help restart society after a play. So I highly recommend Station Eleven. Everyone has one person that inspired them on their path to where they are today. Who was that for you? I guess I, I got three. Okay, I'm sorry you asked. For, I guess you asked for one. But one is uh, my older sister, Gigi, who just due to her both her and my parents' lack of better judgment and oversight. I spent a lot of time around uh, with her and then her friends. So people of college age, you know, when I'm a kid, they're in college and kind of just watching movies, watching independent films, watching all different things. Also, my parents' lack of oversight kind of played into that. So comics, books, whatever, that definitely weren't meant for me. I was consuming at a young age and I think helped me a lot as a storyteller and appreciator of kind of film and art and stuff like that. George Lucas and Steven Spielberg, those two kind of like, because I told said earlier before i even knew what a director did i knew these people told stories these guys are the ones that make these movies they're the ones who, who make them they're the names behind them they're the authors now we know uh, these are huge collaborations when i was six you know that was kind of my concept of it and then lastly jack kirby he's the king for a reason um he's definitely the, the inspiration of astounding tales as a jewish american he's kind of a big inspiration in terms of the art form of comic books especially superhero comics jewish americans were a huge contributor to this art form they continue to be so i do feel it's a little bit of my cultural heritage people that i share a lineage with gave to America, you know, Captain America, Fantastic Four, you know, and then also Stanley Lieber and Jacob Kurtzberg. They had to anglicize their names that uh, Cohen, a very Jewish name, could be right there on that comic uh, now is kind of something I, I think is cool. I just think if people weren't already familiar with maybe in terms of the history of comics, that's kind of a big part of it. So both uh, as an artist in terms of being a writer, not, you know, actually able to draw, producing any type of art. Jack Kirby is just a huge hero to me as a, a storyteller, a creator, and then also kind of the, the cultural aspects of what it means to me, as I said, like a Jewish American. From a professional perspective, you have created two comic books. You're creating another one in your wonderful series, Astounding Tales, and I'm sure you're going to create many more amazing uh, comics and maybe films worry. in the future. So from a professional perspective, you are successful. Do you consider yourself personally successful i guess so like i'm, I'm happy in, i'm definitely happy in my personal life i live across the street from the beach in uh, long beach new york so during the winter not too great as a uh, new york weather can be but pretty decent location uh i got two lovely uh guinea pigs victor von doom and barristan sell me hey if there but if there are any single ladies out there who love comic books like uh feel free you know uh, I, you know if you want to chat about star wars and uh hang out by the beach like uh, you know uh, my dance cards uh my dance cards open overall yeah i'm pretty happy uh, with my life and kind of where i'm at you know most of my friends and family 
uh, especially through this pandemic. I'm kind of lucky that everyone seems to be doing pretty well, both physically, kind of economically and all that. Knock on wood about that. Yeah, I'm pretty privileged in a lot of ways that like I get to spend time writing these scripts that like an amazing artist brings to life. It's kind of hard to separate the personal and professional in that regard that like it, it is definitely very, very rewarding kind of the, the success we've been having and the positive response we've been having with the comic. Uh, so yeah, I think, yeah, I, yeah, sure. Why, why, why the fuck not? Yeah. Hell yeah. You know why well, I say every morning your eyes open. It's way better than the alternative, my man. Every day above ground always works. Shit, yeah. Shit, yeah. The reverse of success is failure. How do you deal with your failures? try to learn from them and try to kind of push forward. My background in a athletics kind of t teaches me that we're kind of, especially with sports, it's kind of an absurd pursuit because you're trying to pursue perfection with imperfect beings, human beings, but we're always trying to kind of play the perfect game, you know, have the perfect practice, et cetera, et cetera. We'll never achieve it, but that's the pursuit. So being aware that failure is out there and that it's a process. And I think regardless of anyone's pursuit, it's the process, not the result. You, you don't want to be tied into results because also if you're too tied into results, you're going to get the wrong takeaways. So I could give a lot of boring sports analogies that probably are, are met, you know, examples of kind of why the being too much into the result is going to get, give you bad habits and the broken clocks right twice a day. Falling in love with the process earlier in the conversation mentioned kind of chopping wood. And I think that applies to really anything you're doing. Most things worth doing aren't easy. I think something like writing or art, that's kind of expression, but that's also a craft. It's about kind of plugging away and falling in love with the process, uh, whether it's the process of producing the thing or getting better at that thing. That's the biggest thing in terms of adversity. Uh, and then also learning what's and being cognizant of what's in your control and what's out of your control. So when that adversity hits or that setback hits in terms of the when you're doing the autopsy on it don't spin your wheels on the things out of your control try to affect as positively the things within your control the young generation is looking at your work and they're becoming inspired to be creative in their own way whether it's as a comic book writer artist creative person or maybe something in the film industry or whatever they would like to be creatively how can they inspire the generation that follows them be passionate about what you do, be honest in terms of the expression. And I think that it will inspire others. And then also, I guess, don't be shy about your loves, your references, that your homages and stuff like that. Because I think with myself, artists and stuff like that have opened my mind to different, what are their influences and kind of going down rabbit holes. I guess regardless of what people, I know this is a, a polarizing band and a kind of a very specific taste, but uh, the band Fish, they do like a wider range of covers. So even if you don't like them, their covers, they cover funk, Motown, all kinds of stuff. So if there's a band you like kind of their influences, I, I think anyone that does any type of art or any type of expression, we don't exist in like a bubble, like hermetically sealed, but whether those inspirations were things from history or people we met in our life or other artists or whatever, putting it out there so that people can then kind of follow those breadcrumbs and kind of get inspired and grow from the tapestry of work. Because also I think in terms of that, that we do know artists from the, the truly greats to people like myself who were kind of toiling away in kind of relative obscurity. We all come from a lineage that it's not some type of mysterious kind of alchemy. I guess uh, results may vary, but that anyone could kind of do it. Well, I do hate to say this, Jake, but that ends this particular episode of Two Geeks Talking. Before I let you go, where can we find you and how can we support you on the internet and, you know, social media and all that other fun stuff? On the Instagrams, I am at uh, underscore Jake underscore, underscore Cohen and Astounding Tales is Astounding underscore Tales. Um, and you'll see that there's the link trees on there that will give you all the information to download, buy physical copies, stay up to date. There's a link to read issue zero for free. And then Twitter is uh, at Jake Scott Cohen and at Astounding Comics, comics with an X. Um, and same thing on there. There's link tree on there that will take you where you need to go if you want to digitally download it via Comics or Amazon now instead of Comicsology. You can buy physical copies through Etsy. Um, and like I said, there's a link on there. Um, that will take you to um, Ray's uh, website and will allow you to read Astounding Tales Issue Zero totally for free. Those are the best ways to uh, to find us. 
Well, like I said, thanks so much, Jake, for coming on the show. Got to get you back. Thank on. you for having me. And thank you for kind of your patience and putting up with me. <laughs> it's all good. We got to come back on like maybe sometime later in the year or next year or whatever. We'll talk films. We'll talk favorite films and all the other jazz. And we'll Please. see what else that we'll dive into the the mindset of what film theory is as well as, you know. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. If people are interested in um, degrees that don't yield any <laughs> finances or jobs, I would love to kind of uh, help spread the gospel. And I can I can second that as well. Too. <laughs> <laughs> like I said, that ends this particular episode of Two Geeks Talking. You can, of course, find this interview and a thousand plus others on our website at twogeekstalking.com or tgtmedia.com. And, of course, on our YouTube channel, youtube.com forward slash tgtmedia. And as I say every week, everyone has a story to tell. It's up to me to help bring that out. Thanks for listening and watching on Two Geeks Talking.